Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. Brought to you by the good people at Khaki, the Center for American Culture and Ideas. Ant, what the hell's new and exciting in your world this week? I ran across actually two related articles that reinforce something that I've been saying for a long time. And let me just give you the articles. The first one is on Ted Wetzel of Ohio. He got into a fight with some friends over political issues and in so doing realized that we need a new method of agreeing to disagree. So he created a gathering that he calls dinner and a fight. He's had 11 of these things so far. People show up with various viewpoints from left, right, independent. They have dinner together. And then Ted announces some polarizing topic like mask wearing or firearm possession, what have you. And they hash this out. They have microphones there and people give their opinions and whatever it is. And he says it's not a debate or a fight, but an attempt to help people see the world differently by understanding others, by listening to them. So that's item number one. And I think that's just beautiful. And it ties into something that I've been saying for a long time, that I think that people fundamentally agree much more than what we perceive in the media. And remember, the media has an incentive to show the extremes at either end. And that ties in with this second article on a recent Harris poll that asked respondents to select adjectives to describe their lives. The top two, happy and hopeful. That doesn't describe anybody that I know. Yeah, but there's a severe selection bias there, James. There's no truth in advertising there. It's not dinner and a fight. Well, actually, on the posters, he crosses out the word fight and writes in dialogue. But dinner and a fight sounds interesting. See, I just did the same thing. (laughs) I'm pandering to listeners (laughs) saying something divisive. But go back to this Harris poll for a second in the poll asking Americans all sorts of things about their attitudes. And here's several things that come out. 76% of respondents, and these were respondents randomly selected, right? So all sorts of ages, genders, across political space, the whole thing. 76% of respondents say that they see the good in those they disagree with. 71% say that they have a friend who doesn't share their views. 57% believe that the culture wars are overblown. 57% think most Americans actually get along with each other. And 56% believe that opportunities exist for nearly all of us to obtain the American dream. Here's the thing, Ant. It's an election year, so you get back to me around about November and talk about how we all see the good in each other, and then I'll take it a lot more seriously. Yeah, but see, this brings us back to this issue of the media. The media has an incentive to portray us as at each other's throats. No doubt we see that and we come to believe it. I don't think it's the media. We're a group of people who can't get along the closer we get to decision-making time. And that's just the reality of the situation. That doesn't have anything to do with the media. That has everything to do with us. Well, I don't know. How many times do you have to hear that the Trump people and the Biden people at the family dinner at Thanksgiving can't be seated at the same table before you stop blaming the media? Yeah, but you only hear about the tables at which they can't get along. You don't hear about the ones at which they do get along because it's not newsworthy. Man Bites Dog Film at 11. Anyway, I think I've got something way more interesting here, and maybe it intersects a little bit with what you've got to say. So I've got a headline coming out of The Guardian, but before you start picking on me because I'm reading The Guardian, it is a five-decade-long study coming out of the Institute for Social and Economic Research at the University of Ethics, and a longitudinal study that hits anything close to five decades is ridiculous, right? Anybody who does anything with social science studies knows that you don't get 50 years of anything. Oh, no. Yeah. Here we've got a very long study that looked at 7,000 people who were all born in 1970, whose lives have been tracked by something called the British Cohort Study. And the research found, and I'm just going to go to the headline, so you know, if you want to dig into the data and come up with a more nuanced view, feel free to send that in a hate mail. Playground bullies do prosper and go on to earn more in middle age. Hmm. How about that? Come to find out, 
many of the qualities that make playground bullies horrible human beings, make them semi or somewhat valuable in the workplace. Aggression in school leads to better paying jobs. We can go one step further from the data that they've accumulated. Those with emotional instability earn less. You know, you might say, well, no shock there. But that would be a shock, actually, to a lot of people who want to valorize those with emotional instability. The latter, I can see. The former, now that I think about it, makes sense. People who are more comfortable pushing others around, I would imagine that there's a greater probability of such people rising to positions of higher management where that's what you have to do. But here's the thing, and I think there's a nuance here that we would really want to tease out. I get that those people would be more inclined to try to do that in the workforce, but the workforce has determined that that's valuable. And that's something that I think a lot of people are going to be very uncomfortable with once they hear it. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily a great thing, but I am saying that that's the logical answer that we arrived at without all kinds of psychological intervention in the workplace. Yeah, but it is valuable. I mean, the whole reason we call it work is because we don't like to do it. In fact, you have to pay people to do it. And so if you've got hold of somebody who's skilled at pushing people around, that person is better apt to organize, to push people forward, to do the jobs that they're supposed to be doing. So yeah, I can see how that's valuable. Having said that, we've all worked for bosses who we would label bullies, and we've all quit those jobs, right? So on the one hand, I get what you're saying. On the other, I know it's patently wrong. But somewhere in the middle of those two things is an uncomfortable truth. And my guess is, is that playground bullies learn how to bully effectively later in life, which is probably not the kind of thing we want to conclude, but probably the kind of thing we have to conclude if this study is indicative of what we're going to find in the broader West. I refer our listeners back to the Star Trek episode, the original oh, series, where Kurt, we I'm, a, I'm about to bully you. Kirk is split into two parts. One is his animalistic part and the other is his intellectual, emotional part. And they quickly find that neither side can survive without the other. Without the animalistic part, the emotional, the intellectual part has no drive. And without the emotional, intellectual part, the animalistic part is, well, it's just an animal. And maybe you have a situation here where those schoolyard bullies, some of them actually learn to harness that, to temper it. Yes, they can use it, they can draw on it in pushing people forward, but also the good managers are the ones who don't bully you to the extent that you say, I'm out of here. Yeah, and that's going to always, I think, be the crux of the matter, right? How authoritative can you be without alienating the people who work beneath you? Because right. the minute you lose them, you never get them back. And when you can't lead your team, you will be replaced. You see all the difficulties here, but the biggest difficulty is this. We might not want to discourage bullies to the extent that we do. Mm. That doesn't sound right at all, does it? I'm going to go with the working hypothesis of maybe we don't want to discourage them from being bullies so much as teach them how to harness that part of themselves. We'll see what the hate mail brings this week, because I think this one is beyond interesting. But anyway, and this leads us to, of course... The foolishness of the week. The foolishness of the week concerns the biggest bully of them all, the United States federal government, the Justice Department specifically here. The Justice Department has accused Apple of being a monopoly. Yeah, I read that just this morning, actually. But only insofar as iPhones are concerned. It doesn't seem to care about iPads or MacBooks or any of the other things. Odd when I think about it because I, of course, have a MacBook and I have an iPad, but I don't have an iPhone, which would lead me to believe it's not a monopoly at all. Monopoly means it's the only one there. Now, I've often complained about this, that Apple doesn't play well with others, but not playing well with others does not a monopoly make. Not playing well with others is the very point of the lawsuit. And Apple says they're going to defend themselves vigorously, and I suspect they will come out well on top of this one. As is so often the case, the Biden administration looked and said, oh, look, a foot. Where's the gun? And promptly shot itself in the foot. <laughs> the argument that the government is making, if you can call it an argument, isn't the one you might think. 
if Apple is guilty of monopoly, that means they're not allowing, it's, it's even asinine to say it this way, they're not allowing competition. But of course, Apple has competition all over the place. You and I once had iPhones. You and I now, neither of us have iPhones. Right. Why? Because there was just a better option out there, so we took it. And other people who come to the opposite conclusion that their iPhone is a better option, well, they'll keep it. And that seems to me to be all the bulwark one needs against monopoly, that there are options and people can choose whatever they want. But the government is claiming that if you use an iPhone, you're limited by Apple to what you can do with your device. So they have to claim that people who willingly chose this device and knowingly chose to be limited in certain key respects are somehow victims. Right. And people who chose not to have iPhones and not to be limited in those ways are not victims. The government is here to save the iPhone users from themselves. I asked rhetorically how, what with this retrograde idea that I've got that government should do as little as possible and leave everybody alone, how it was that I'm the outlier in the United States of America. And a bunch of people on Twitter pointed out exactly the ways I am the outlier. You know, I think a lot of them would agree with what they're seeing out of the government in this crackpot scheme they got. But here are some of the things that the government is going to protect iPhone users over. They can't send secure iMessages to somebody with an Android phone. I thought the government didn't like us sending secure messages. Well, apparently they don't until they do, and they only do when (laughs) Apple users can't do it. You can't try some apps that you might like to try. You can't tap to pay with anything other than Apple Pay. Yeah, all of these things are things that the market works out. The market has already worked all of these things out. I was going to say, and if they still exist, it's because the market said, yeah, this is cool. So I am wholly unimpressed with government logic. You know, I would love to know why they're wasting my money and their time with this nonsense. Because they need to be seen to be doing something. And fighting monopolies always brings out the voters. Earlier, we did point out that it is an election year. You might be on to something there, Ant. That's where we are with this, and I can't wait for Apple to vigorously defend itself here. I really can't. I look forward to hearing what the rejoinders are going to be. I have to look this up. Here we go. Apple's market share worldwide, 27%. Well, is that for iPhones or is that just in electronics more broadly? That's generically Apple. Let's see iPhone market share. iPhones, I believe, are about 35% in the United States. It says in the U.S., iPhone has 58% market share. That doesn't sound right at all. Yeah, that's consistent with what I've heard, that iPhone is predominant in the U.S. But worldwide, it says Android has a 70% market share. Lucky the U.S. government doesn't have to concern itself with worldwide issues. How you can claim that a 58% of anything is a monopoly, I'll never know. Yeah, monopoly means there's only one seller. And so long as you've got an option to go somewhere else, and frankly, I think the option in this case is way better than the iPhone. I don't know that it's way better. I actually look at iPhones from time to time and think, well, maybe I'd like to go back. But frankly, the amount of money they charge for a telephone is asinine. Well, it is. In a way, Apple's getting its comeuppance here. The reason I left years ago iPhone in favor of Android was because Apple seemed to take a very hands-on attitude. It was going to tell you what you could and could not install on the phone. It was going to control how you use the phone, oddly doing to the user the same thing the government's now attempting to do to Apple. I typically, when I need a phone, and I typically need a phone once every four or five years, I go out and I buy the best $300 phone I can find, and then it lasts another four or five years. Mm -hmm. You know, an iPhone's going to cost you almost $1,000 to get something less than the best option, and people go and they replace that every year. That's astounding. Okay. I mean, somebody at Apple wants to send me an iPhone, I'll check it out, but I'm not paying that kind of money for a phone. See, that's markets. I don't have to care why somebody would. All I have to do is buy whatever the hell I want, and everybody else can do the same. And when they do, we should leave them alone. 
For one-stop shopping for all things James and Ant, visit our website, wordsandnumbers.org. We give a special shout-out to our Patreon sponsors who help us keep the lights on. If you'd like to contribute, go to patreon.com slash wordsandnumbers. Speaking of leaving people alone, you've come up with a topic this week. A rare bird. <laughs> you almost never come up with a topic anymore, but lo and behold, you did this week. And it's all about telling people what they must or must never do. Yeah, and this story actually begins with James prior to 2020 when uh, James and I were on the road and we would visit high schools and colleges and give lectures and we must have gone to what like 50 different venues each year over time it became harder and harder for me to hear the students it happened so slowly that I wasn't aware of it but I guess because we only saw each other maybe once a month or once every other month you became acutely aware of it and you used to complain I need to get hearing aids I said yeah this is nonsense stuff you know I, I don't need this oh let me stop you right there you are as deaf as a stone. <laughs> I just pretend not to hear you, James. I'm going to be honest. I don't hear so well anymore, and I haven't for a long time. All those years playing in the metal bands did my hearing in. I can barely hear anything. I can't talk on the phone with my right ear, for example. But you, my friend, <laughs> I have more luck talking to a pancake than I have talking to you. It's amazing how deaf you are. And I will talk and you will look right at me. And then you'll say, did you say something? <laughs> As if you didn't see my lips moving the whole time. So to say that <laughs> it became somewhat clear to you that you couldn't hear. How the hell could you be unclear on this point <laughs> when everything happening around you was a complete and total mystery because you were deaf? <laughs> It was a bit of a mystery, wrong with you? <laughs> Good Lord. Well, here's the thing. James is on about this for quite some time. And finally, it occurred to me, maybe I should look into this. But being somewhat vain and also young, I was absolutely young? not. Young. I you want, you want people want. to believe you were young. I you were 55 years old. You were 55 years old. That is not young. I'm going to just delete this, so it's okay. Can you delete anything you want? <laughs> I was insistent that if indeed I did get hearing aids, they had to be absolutely invisible. So none of this thing on the back of your ear or a, even the clear wire that you see going in, none of that. I want absolutely invisible. And it turns out such an animal does exist. In fact, it was, I guess at the time, relatively new. It sticks inside your ear and you cannot see a thing. There is nothing external. I saw these and I thought, okay, the only way to get James off my back is to get these things. But the only ones I'm going to get are these in-the-ear things. And because they're relatively new, they were incredibly expensive. So I said, fine, I'll get one. And I used it for maybe two or three months and again on the road with you. And it was just astounding, the nonsense that you say that now I'm hearing. So like an idiot, I thought, well, let's get another one. I can hear even more of James. So I got the other one. So I had two of these and everything's fine. But here's the thing. They required going to a audiologist and they take a, whatever this is, the measurement of your ear. They actually make a cast of the ear canal and they make this thing a special made for you and the whole thing. And the audiologist adjusts it. And then you go off and you use it for a while and you can come back and it has some memory that records all the things that it's done and they can download it and say, okay, it seems to be working well under these circumstances and not well under those circumstances. They'll make some changes and off you go again. If you want something else, you want more volume or you want, you know, the troubles more, or whatever it is, you have to come back again. The audiologist adjusts this thing. This is how it works. Now, I had to save my pennies for these. This set was $5,000. Holy sh**. Yeah. You know how much that should have cost? $200. I'm getting there because something fascinating happened. And that is one year, maybe two years, but not more than two years after I got these hearing aids, this new law went into effect 
And it was one of the things that Biden had said he was going to do if he was elected. And indeed, he did do this or he pushed Congress to do it. And that is to exempt certain hearing aids from FDA rules. Now, if you stop and think about it, it makes perfect sense because businesses, Sony and Samsung and whoever, has been marketing earbuds for decades. They know this business. And the earbuds do basically the same thing that the hearing aids do. Why not let them do this? Why do you have to have a audiologist and a prescription and all of this nonsense? So, fast forward to a month ago. These, God, it pains me to say it these $5,000 hearing aids, malfunctioned. Take me to audiologist and she says, oh, okay, we've got to send it in for repairs. It's all under warranty, no problem. But she has to send it in for repairs, right? So I've got nothing. So it occurs to me, all right, look, these things are going to have limited life anyway, and this is going to happen in the future where it has to be sent away. I need a backup pair. So I started looking. James, I found from Sony a pair that do everything that my $5,000 pair does that is only two years old. Do you know how much this pair of Sony's cost? I'm going to go back and I'm going to say $200. It does more than that. $800. Because I'm wearing a pair of top flight yep. Sony earbuds yep. right now. Well, I got those for $150, but I'm a cheap and I buy them on the gray market and they're $300 new. So maybe $800 for yeah. something more specialized with microphones that are a little more adept at amplifying the incoming sound. Yeah, okay, I could live with 800 bucks. But here's the thing, Ant. When you bought those regulated hearing aids, you didn't die. That's true, I didn't die. Wait, I wasn't going to die anyway. <laughs> Wait a second. Hearing aids never killed anybody in the first place. Right. So why on earth do we have a government monopoly here? Wait a second. Monopoly? What? Yeah, right. Let me tell you why we have it, or at least one reason. It's to keep the audiologists in business. Because this set that I got from Sony, that is, I swear to you, it is identical in size, shape, everything, in functionality to the expensive ones. This set that I got from Sony required no prescription, no appointment with the audiologist. In fact, you get it, and if you need to adjust it, which on the expensive pair, I have to make an appointment and go see the audiologist, sit in the office while they make the adjustments, all of this. This new set, I do it on my phone with an app. Yeah, no, I'm guessing the Sony people have an app to handle these. Yep. Whenever you talk about the FDA, you're always going to be able to find a bunch of examples that are pure nonsense, right? And I remember my children. What did they want when they were younger? They wanted Kinder Eggs. A chocolate treat that inside has a little price. Yeah, like Cracker Jack, but chocolate. And the FDA has decided th these are adulterated food. That's the classification. Mm -hmm. And it's illegal to bring them into the United States. Why? Because some precious snowflake might choke on them. Mm -hmm. As if maybe parents shouldn't be watching over children when they ate things. I mean, what are we going to do next? Are we going to outlaw peaches because they have pits? Somehow, children don't choke to death on pits, and those are all larger than Kinder Egg toys. And if this is somehow unconvincing to you, I give you also nectarines, plums, cherries. There are all kinds of pitted fruits out there. And yet, somehow, we manage to eat them without dying. And yet, the FDA must save us from ourselves, from Kinder Eggs. Yeah, now, I think there's a middle ground here. The FDA does good. It tests drugs, it finds bad side effects, it keeps bad drugs off the market. No question it does this. We're going to get to drugs in just a minute, but let's stick with food. Because, you know, I went to Edinburgh, Scotland for a while, and one of the first things I did once I got there, I sat down at a restaurant and I ordered some haggis. You can't have haggis in the United States. The FDA outlaws it. You can't have a lung in food in the United States. Why? No clue. The Scots all seem to eat it on a daily basis. And while, let's be honest, I wouldn't want to eat haggis on a daily basis, I would have it every once in a while. The Scots aren't dying wholesale. What else can't you have, Aunt? Beluga caviar. Japanese puffer fish. Now, those will kill you. Yeah, they will, but they don't. 
shark fins can't have shark fins. Chinese grind up shark fins for all kinds of things. This is a very short sample of a very long list. Why is the government telling us what we can and cannot eat? Well, I think when it comes to food, you could make an argument, look, there are some things, you know, take the puffer fish as an example, that can kill you under certain circumstances. And one could make the argument that, look, okay, if the FDA goes too far, what's the downside? Well, the downside is you don't get to eat haggis. Well, big deal. The upside is we've got the FDA preventing you from dying from puffer fish. I can see the argument here. I don't know that I agree with it, but I can see a stronger argument for the FDA when it comes to food. But when it comes to drugs, I think it's a different matter because here the FDA can kill you either way. And we only tend to see the one way. That is, here's a bad drug that comes along, it kills people, and the FDA is going to stand between us and that drug and prevent that drug from getting at us and therefore save lives. We see that side of the equation. We never see the other side of the equation, which is here's a drug that could save your life and the FDA is going to stand in the way and prevent you from getting it and therefore people die. I want to back off on that claim a little bit because I'm willing to say the drugs might save your life. That's good enough for me. Fair enough. Doesn't even have to be the drug will. The drug might. There's a one in a million chance that the drug will save your life. There are always people who will take a one in a million chance on anything because it's better than the chances they're facing. If you're looking at certain death from any number of things that you might be suffering from, a one in a million shot in the dark is well worth it to you. And it should be your choice. It's your call. It's your life, so it's your call. The government has exactly no business telling you what you should and shouldn't take. Whenever this comes up, people gravitate towards the thalidomide problem, which was a drug that was given back decades ago that led to all kinds of really severe birth defects when pregnant women took the drug. It was a morning sickness drug, wasn't it? I'm not sure. Pregnant women took this drug, and I think there were over 10,000 babies born because of it with incredibly severe birth defects. It functionally ruined the lives of not only those babies, but their families. Yeah. I don't want to minimize that or things like that, right? Because that sort of thing can, in fact, and does and has happened. I'm willing to be very careful when I walk around here. But ham-fisted government regulation always grows. And how we get from thalidomide decades ago to kinder eggs right now is living proof of that problem. If you want to put government in a very hemmed-in area and say, look, this is the danger. Here's what we're trying to avoid. Here's what we're going to do to avoid that. As long as you never get mission creep, I'm on board. I agree with you. Mission creep is an issue. But even before the mission creep shows up, I think you've got this problem of people only seeing one half of the thing. And we saw this during COVID. Everyone said, well, the masks are going to save lives or the vaccine is going to save lives or whatever it is. And that's fine. There is that side of it. But there's also another side. And the other side is people losing their lives from all sorts of various reasons. We had a guest on a few months ago whose research shows evidence for the masks actually concentrating the virus and giving people this false sense of security such that they go out and they mingle more than they would have otherwise, thereby leading to more deaths. The open question is which effect is stronger, the positive effect on the one side or the negative on the other. But to answer that question, you've got to acknowledge that there are two sides to this. We overlook the self-regulating nature of markets. Hmm. Who, once the evidence starts rolling in that a certain drug or a certain food or what have you is harmful or maybe to a lesser extent just not working at all, useless, let's say, Who's going to keep taking it? For some reason, we are never allowed to think that through by the government. Let me just ask you a hypothetical, Ant. Do you take any supplements? As a matter of course, do you take supplements, vitamins at every day? No. Herbs, minerals, what have you? I do. I take them all the time. Mm -hmm. And there are any number of things that I take every day. Are they FDA regulated? No. Do they kill me? No. What would happen if a multivitamin on the market started killing people tomorrow? 
that multivitamin would be off the market by the end of the day. Right. Nobody would take it on the one hand, and the company putting it on the market would move heaven and earth to get it off to protect their business interests. Yeah, and that's where people, I think, go off the rails. They go to this trope of, well, the company's only out for the profit, so it wants to send out drugs that will kill people. Well, how many dead people take medicine? Right, (laughs) yeah. If you're out for profit, you actually don't want to send out drugs that are going to kill people. The want of profit is the most powerful motivator that we have. People's behaviors are altered because they want to make a profit. You can bet on profit. You can't bet that they're going to be decent people everywhere you look, but you can bet on profit. Good case in point is what happened with Tylenol, with poisonings. That's exactly right. Whenever it was the 70s or 80s, somebody who actually was never caught. Oh, no, that guy got caught. Oh, really? I thought he wasn't. Well, nonetheless, I believe he was trying to kill his wife, and then he was trying to make it look like the entire batch of Tylenol had been poisoned. Yeah, so he goes around to the grocery stores or wherever the Tylenol is being sold and injects them with some kind of chemical. People came along, they bought the Tylenol, they died. Eventually, the deaths are linked to the Tylenol. And it's not Tylenol's fault, right? It's this guy who's tampering with the final product. And he's not a Tylenol employee. He's a guy walking through the grocery store, picking these off the shelf. He's a dirtbag who wanted to kill his wife. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what does Tylenol do? Somebody who says Tylenol is only out for the profit is going to say, well, Tylenol wouldn't do anything. It's not their fault, right? What did Tylenol do? It recalled every Tylenol capsule everywhere in the United States to extreme expense and then designed a safety cap. The safety caps that you see now on medicine didn't exist back then. Tylenol pioneered them, designs a safety cap, re-releases all of this at tremendous expense to Tylenol. Why? Precisely because they were interested in profit. They did not want people to do what you just described and said, well, I'm not buying Tylenol anymore. Which people did say for a while, right, as is natural. And then we all took a look at the things that Tylenol did in the marketplace to make its product safe. And we all thought, well, you know what? That could have happened to any company. And the company it did happen to did the right thing. And as a result, the tamper-proof packaging that Tylenol developed is now on everything. Not only is it on everything, but there's an interesting FDA story here because people will point to the FDA and said, well, we have this tamper-resistant packaging because the FDA requires it. Yes, the FDA does require it. But you know why they require it? Because Tylenol developed it. And the FDA looked at it and said, hey, that's a good idea. And two years later, FDA required everyone to use it. The more you see this sort of thing, the self-correcting nature of the market the more you realize that government can only come in after the fact. Markets can react today. Yes. And not only can they, they do. Now, you can say it's only because people want to make a profit, but I don't care why. Mm -hmm. I just care that it happens. We're all better off as a result, so there you go. So tell me again why I can't have Kinder Eggs. <laughs> right, we're going to keep coming back to this, Ant, because it's government overstepping, because that's what government does. What do markets never do? Markets never overstep. Oh, I disagree. A market wants to give you the option you want. Yeah. And when the market finds out you got an option you didn't want, it very quietly changes the game. Yeah, and I think that last thing is correct. I think markets do overstep, but they very quickly realize they've done it and back off. Everywhere I look, government goes too far. Mm -hmm. How do I know this? The FDA won't let me have all kinds of food I want, medicines I might need, and you can't have a hearing aid. God knows why. Every reasonable person knows there is no good reason to limit hearing aids that any company might want to put on the market. Well, it does keep the audiologists in business. Yeah, I don't care about that. I care about people who can't hear being able to hear. Right. Who can't afford hearing aids when they cost $5,000. We don't ever stop to think about that. What about poor people who can't afford hearing aids? Let me go back to the plus and minus of FDA regulation. On the plus side, they protect us from drugs that might harm us. But on the negative side, on the minus side, they stand in the way of drugs that might help us. And the numbers I'm going to quote here come from a friend of ours, Howie Bacher, his book, Free Our Markets. He has a whole chapter on this. 
I'm just going to quote three of the drugs that he lists in his chapter. And these are three drugs. His book is maybe five, seven years old at this point. I don't know whether the FDA has subsequently approved these drugs, but these three drugs at the time that he published his book were drugs that were not FDA approved. So you could not buy them in the U.S., but they were approved in Europe. And what he's done here is compared the number of people they can point to and say conclusively, these Europeans who were taking these drugs would have died had they not had the drugs. And he simply counts how many of these per year, how many of their lives are being saved because of the drug, and then does the adjustment for population size and says, well, we've got so many people in this country suffering from the same thing. If they had access to the drug, this is how many in the U.S. would have lived who didn't. Here we have these three drugs. Thrombolytic therapy. I say drug, it's, that's a whole regimen of things. But thrombolytic therapy dissolves blood clots. I guess the FDA did subsequently approve it. It took two years to do this. Over the course of those two years, 22,000 people died who would not have died had they had access to this drug. So right there, however many lives FDA saves by standing in the way of bad drugs, there's 22,000 people who died who wouldn't have died had it not been for the FDA standing in the way of a good drug. Interleukin-2, which treats kidney cancer, took three and a half years to pass FDA approval. 3,500 people died who would not have died otherwise had the FDA not stood in the way. Misoprotol, which prevents bleeding ulcers, took nine and a half years to make it through FDA's hoops. Over the course of those nine and a half years, anywhere from eight to 15,000 people died who wouldn't have died otherwise. This is the negative side of FDA that we don't see. Not only does it take a lot of time to get something through FDA approval, it takes a lot of money. Yeah. So not only can we say without doubt that, okay, it's really expensive, what else does that mean? That means small companies that could bring drugs to market are not allowed to. So whenever you hear people saying, well, why are medications so expensive? Here's item number one. Yeah. If you're not willing to say, well, the government shouldn't make drugs more expensive, well, then you're not willing to have the FDA regime that we now have. And yet everybody's going to walk around saying the government should make drugs cheaper, but we should also have the FDA doing everything it does. You can't have both of those things at the same time. There are two things here driving the drug prices where FDA is concerned. One is it's really expensive to jump through the FDA hoops to get approval. So right there, you're raising the price of the drug. Two, this business you describe about the small companies not being able to afford to make it through. So there's all sorts of entrepreneurs who might have good ideas for drugs, we're not going to see those. And because of that, there'll be less competition. And because there's less competition, prices are necessarily going to be higher. Brought to you by your government. And yet the same people who say we must have a vibrant, strong, robust FDA are the same exact people who say drugs should be cheaper. I think there's a solution here. Everyone to a person who has said to me what you just said, we need the FDA to keep these bad drugs off the market. When I offer this solution, every single one of them have said, at least, that's an interesting idea I want to think about. Most of them say, yeah, absolutely. And here's the solution I propose. Make FDA compliance voluntary. The FDA continues to do all of the things it does now. It runs the tests and you jump through the hoops and all of that. And when you do and you're successful, you get a stamp on your drug that says this is FDA approved. And if you don't jump through those hoops, you have to have a stamp on your product that says this is not FDA approved. It could kill you and it could kill you in an incredibly painful way. Proceed at your own risk and then let people decide for themselves. There are only two problems with that. The first is the obvious one. People are going to say, well, I can make that decision for myself, but all these stupid people can't possibly be trusted to make that decision for themselves, which is exactly the point of view that gets the regulatory state rolling in the first place. I'm good enough for this, but all the great unwashed out there, they can't be trusted to make up their own minds. 
But then you're going to end up with this second problem, and it's a much more real problem that you're going to have to actually solve. You can point your finger and laugh at the first people. When the first person dies, what are you going to do? His family is going to say, well, that's not what killed him. It was these other things. Hmm. The courts are going to be bogged down separating wheat from chaff for the rest of all time. And there's no easy way out of that problem. So while ideally and intellectually, I like your answer, and I think people should always be able to decide the level of risk they're willing to take. I don't know that we would be able to operationalize this one with anything approaching the level of ease that we would have to be able to in order to make it work. Yeah, that's an interesting criticism. Let me balance it with one more positive that stems from this solution, and that is this solution that I proposed would create a market vote of confidence in the FDA. How do we know the FDA is doing a good job, doing both things, letting good drugs onto the market, keeping bad ones off? One way to tell under this solution is to observe how many drugs are being sold with the FDA approval versus being sold without it. And if you find that 90% of the drugs that people are buying don't have FDA approval, that tells you immediately that the market has decided that whatever the FDA is doing isn't efficacious. And that's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Until next time, send us email, wordsandnumberspodcast at gmail.com. Try to be nice to one person who doesn't deserve it. Till next week, can't take it easy. See you next week, James. Thank you.